Session 5, California Rubber Asphalt Trends and Opportunities. And I'm going to welcome Nate Golf back up to the stage. Thank you, Sally. Um, we have a very distinguished panel for you um, to look at the rubberized asphalt uh, trends and opportunities. Um, we have representatives from industry, local government, and Caltrans here to talk a little bit about their own purview of, of the whole rubber asphalt industry um, and give you some information on what's going on and also be here to answer your questions. So first of all, we have Karina Wong, our first speaker. She's a quality engineer manager with Granite Construction and she's the chair of the Green Book Asphalt Task Force. Uh, for, you, for those of you that don't know, the Green Book is a public work specifying uh, organization uh, in Southern California. They do all the public work specifications for asphalt, for public uh, civil engineering construction projects and that type of thing. Um, so she's involved in that as the chair of the Asphalt Task Force. Uh, she's been in the industry for 17 years um, and she has become a pavement materials expert. Um, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. That's what's, on, that's what's on her bio. <laughs> so I believe her. Um, she has been a leader in the development of, of not only quality materials and programs at Granite, um, but in, in her capacity as the uh, Green Book Task Force ma uh, Manager. She's also been working with other uh, industry partners and local government partners to, to develop the, the top specifications for uh, asphalt products. Um, let's see. And, and one thing that I do, I do like that she wrote in her bio, she continues to evolve and improve her understanding and stay abreast of the newest uh, you know, technology and research that's going on with the, with the pavement materials. Um, the other thing on her, and I'm paraphrasing her bio, you can read it if you like, but the other thing I like about her, she likes to bake. <laughs> so she, she mentioned that in her bio and I wanted, I wanted to mention that too. So with that, I'll welcome Karina to the, to the I'm sorry, Karina Wong to the podium. Thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. We got your presentation ready. I forgot to tell you, that's forward, that's back. Okay. Okay. So I guess the one thing I wanted to highlight in my bio is I don't always just look to improve the materials in our construction, but kind of as a character flaw, I'm always looking to improve, whether it's our hot mix or my baking. So I just kind of start with that. And again, I'm here to kind of introduce the industry perspective on <clears throat> rubber asphalt trends that we're seeing. I would say I would kind of questioned why I was brought up here. And then I started, the more I got into thinking about this presentation, the more it got me to think about what I want to do and take back with me. So I think that was probably why I was tasked with this. Um, so I'm going to just start with a little bit of an industry perspective. We all know about SB1, right? Uh, SB1 was passed back in 2017. We've seen plenty of increases in lane miles paved. But one thing that stuck out to me is when we looked at the granite experience, we're actually seeing a 15% decrease in <clears throat> uh, crumb rubber usage. So how are we going up <laughs> in one direction in terms of lane miles paved, but then we're going down in terms of usage of crumb rubber? And it could be our company, right? Or it could be a trend. So I kind of wanted to dig a little deeper. So then I looked at some of the published paving t tonnages that are published by Caltrans. And the reason I wanted to highlight this, a lot of our asphalt rubber is specified through Caltrans. Many local agencies also specify rubber asphalt, but the one thing that sticks out with Caltrans, they have mandates. So they mandated 35% usage in their roadways and they have an impact across the state. Whereas local agencies, it's kind of agency specific trends. Um, and what you're seeing here is, their paving tonnages have kind of flatlined. So right around the time we saw a slight decrease, they're flatlining. So then kind of I was thinking, well, how do we, how do we get better, right? So that was my next thought in this presentation. But before we get there, I just kind of want to talk about how Caltrans 
or not Caltrans, California is involved in this tire recycling. So we predominantly use something called a wet process. And what that means is we're recycling the, the crumb rubber at our facilities. So we use these portable plants. We're mixing crude rubber, or sorry, virgin rubber asphalt with the CRM in a tank. It's blended up. It goes into this tank where it kind of digests. And the idea behind the digestion is it's giving that rubber time to melt into the asphalt, right? And typically the types of, or the percentages of rubber that we're seeing in this asphalt concrete product is anywhere from 13 to 17% scrap tire rubber. However, we also have to add between three to 7% high nat rubber. The really important part there is Caltrans currently is specifying that high nat rubber be produced from scrap tires. And the, I wanna highlight that in terms of one thing I didn't realize when we report our scrap tire usage, we're usually only reporting the scrap tire CRM. We're not usually reporting the high nat CRM. And now we're learning that some of our providers or producers of CRM, that high nat CRM actually is scrap tire. So we might be under reporting our, our usage and our consumption. So I wanted to highlight that because that's an opportunity. I didn't even realize, <laughs> right? When they sell us, it says high nat. Now we're realizing, oh no, that's scrap tire high nat. But for those who aren't doing that, it's also an opportunity, okay? Um, that's what we're doing in the state. So what are other states doing with crumb rubber modified product? Okay, so Arizona and Texas, they do something called a terminal blend binder. What that means is they're blending the asphalt at the terminal with the CRM. Mind you, this is a CRM that's been processed to an even finer gradation, meaning size, so that when it's blended up, it can fully be digested. And you can kind of see the comparison of the two products. On the left, you see the California product. You can see it's quite lumpy versus the Arizona and Texas product where it's more smooth. We would call this more of a, uh, since it's so uniform, we can use it similar to a polymer modified binder. For those non-technical, <laughs> what that means is this binder now has the flexibility of something like a plastic. It's more flexible, resistant to cracking, and it's elastic, so if you overload it, it can rebound, so it's also resistant to rutting. So this could be a desirable product or property in other states, right? And it is also a desirable product for us. But the one caveat is typically the blending of the CRM is done in a proprietary terminal blend process. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's very proprietary. In fact, <laughs> as being part of the Asphalt Task Force Group, we're looking to open up the grading band or the specification of this product to be able to use it down south more often. And the reason we wanna do that is now we can use it in our regular mixes, not just these special rubberized gap graded mixes. Um, California, we use these gap graded mixes because we have to allow room for those little globules, right? If we just put in our regular mixes, it won't work out as well structurally, so we have to accommodate the sizes of the little pieces. Okay, so opportunities. I know that they were saying we, we can increase our usage. I, I, I can't control how much paved miles we're paving. Everything suggests we're getting a lot more money in infrastructure, so we expect the trends to increase. However, one thing we can do, even if it doesn't increase, let's say recession kicks in and somehow the money that we expect to be there isn't there. To be honest, the money that we expected to be there is there, but things cost more. So the, what we can do with it is less. I think everybody knows that. Um, I wanted to highlight, if we were able to figure out this terminal blend rubber for California, and when I say figure it out, I mean figure out a way to get it specified, we could increase our, our across the board usage by 24%. Barriers, <laughs> Katrina will tell you, they're not telling us not to use this, right? <laughs> Katrina would love us to use it, but the problem is cost, right? So as a contractor, I cannot tell my plant manager, use this more costly product. We're, we're bidding, we're in a low bid environment, right? So if we wanna be competitive, we can't use it unless there's 
a specifying reason. So what kind of specifying reasons could we have? Um, if it's required, such as with rubberized asphalt, right? We do have a requirement to use at least 35% within the Caltrans world. I don't know how local agencies specify their, their prescription of the usage of rubberized asphalt. They might have their own, you know, uh, metrics. However, if we can figure out how to get this mainstreamed within Caltrans, I think it would be more acceptable. And then again, going back to asphalt task force group, we're making it available in our specification and trying to make it more open so we can allow more producers into the market. Um, and again, it's gonna be up to local agencies how they wanna apply that. Another way we can increase our rubber usage, at least 30%, 33% from what we're currently doing, is using this Caltrans HiNAP CRM. So that's not across the board, that's just increasing from what we're currently doing, right? So I said that roughly 15% is a scrap tire CRM. Another 5% is this high nat CRM that previously historically was not scrap tire. Now they're able, the CRM processors are able to process, um, I guess the way it's been explained to me, they segregate tires from heavy vehicles and they're able to process the special product. And then we, if we require that to be in there, we go from 15% to 20% rubber usage. So that's an opportunity. And if we're already doing it, we just gotta give ourselves credit. So one of the pro problems is when we make hot mix asphalt or rubberized hot mix asphalt, I have to fill out a form that says how many tires were used in the production of this hot mix. And if I didn't realize that that high net product was scrap tire derived, I wouldn't give anybody the credit. So we need to be educated, we need to ask the question. I didn't know to ask the question until I gave this presentation and I started calling everybody. Um, in fact, I think I was calling CRM left and right, so big plug to those guys. Um, moving forward, what are obstacles? So some of the obstacles we encounter as a hot mix producer is the increasing concerns regarding air toxics and emissions being generated in the production of asphalt concrete in general, but specifically rubberized asphalt concrete. And when I say specifically, when we produce this, it gives off a smell. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever burned rubber or plastic, it gives off a distinctive smell. And if you're, not that we were intending to be in an urban environment, but over time, you know, urban environments are encircling our plants. And when the neighbors smell something different, their immediate concern is, are you poisoning my family? So from a permitting standpoint, some of the facilities in urban environments are shying away from wanting to produce rubberized asphalt. So we make it commonplace, we have to keep this in mind. And the, kind of my call or challenge to folks is, we feel that recycling tires is a, beneficial of, to, a benefit to society, we kind of have to work with our, our environmental air emissions boards to kind of balance what, what that looks like for everyone, right? Because we're gonna continue to get calls re regarding its safety. And right now we don't have the information to, to tell them anything different, right? All we can do is maybe move that production out to a different facility. Um, let's see. Another opportunity is stagnation of our asphalt rubber specifications. So one thing is we haven't touched the specification in over 20 years. Actually, they originated in Green Book. But right now, the way they're, they're being utilized, it's very recipe blend. There's opportunity to update those specifications. In fact, the more I thought about this presentation, the more I wanted to open back up my rubberized asphalt specification in Green Book and see if there are opportunities. Again, local agencies right now are not even identifying that high nat is a scrap tire product. Ooh, that's a huge opportunity. Um, there's other opportunities in terms of the design. And so the more I think about it, the more opportunities I can find. Uh, the other item, and this is kind of something I've identified like in the last month or so, is right now the uh, federal government, when they sent out their infrastructure bill, they tied it to green credits. 
you're thinking, okay, well, green credits. Well, this is going to be administered through this thing called EPDs. EPDs are environmental product declarations. They're kind of like nutritional labels for your products. And they kind of tell you what your carbon footprint is of a product. If somehow we can give ourselves credit for keeping the rubber tires out of the landfill, that could help us get more money into the system to cover the cost, increased cost of these products. Rubberized asphalt concrete does cost more than your conventional asphalt concrete. So that might be a way to kind of subsidize the cost. Um, other things that kind of came to mind are, it also incentivizes people to process the material locally. Those EPDs significantly go up with transportation costs. So if you're hauling from Pennsylvania, unfortunately, your EPD would show that. If you're hauling from within 30 miles of your facility, your EPD is gonna go significantly down. So another plug for, you know, California processing. Um, one last thing is again, projects that could use rubberized asphalt are maybe not identified. And this has to do with, you know, again, Caltrans does a really good job of educating their people about their mandates and their goals, but local agencies are getting left behind. People retiring, the people coming in may not realize that there's this effort to increase rubber asphalt concrete usage. They may not understand it, how you could use it. So, you know, again, a call to educate, a call to kind of make sure we continue and embrace the rubberized asphalt concrete. That, that's all I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so what we'll do, um, we'll hold the questions till after all three speakers have, have given their presentations. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Frank Farshidi. Uh, he, is the, he is the maintenance division manager for the city of San Jose. Uh, Frank has worked in San Jose for the past eight years um, and has managed a growing pavement program. Uh, and their current budget is roughly $100 million dollars and that's to cover the maintenance of 575 lane miles of streets annually. Uh, I, I originally met Frank when he was at the University of California, uh, Davis, where he got his PhD and his master's. Um, and he was working as a, research, a researcher on some of the projects that Cal Recycle had uh, contracted with UC Davis. Um, so he's, he's, he's from, he's originally went to Cal State Fullerton Correct? Okay, and then he finished up his, his graduate work at, uh, at UC Davis. Um, and he has over 10 years of pavement ex uh, engineering experience, including all these things on his bio, pavement design, infrastructure, asset management, material characterization, and staff mentoring and training. So I'd like to introduce Frank Farshidi. First off, thank you, Nate, and thank you, Calorie Cycle, for having me, and thank you, audience, uh, for your time uh, this afternoon. I know uh, just uh, right after the break, so. All right, perfect. So the focus of my uh, my presentation is to provide you, uh, pr provide you all with uh, with the perspective from a local agency, City of San Jose. Just to give you an idea, City of San Jose, we. Uh, we are the third largest uh, city in California, right after uh, LA, San Diego, uh, and, uh, San, uh, San Jose is the third largest population-wise. Uh, our uh, street network, so how does that compare? So this is the overall network that we have. We have, we have it divided into two major uh, street types, so we uh, call them major streets, where uh, those are the main arterials and collectors that we have in the city streets, and the residential, so local and neighborhood streets for a combined uh, mileage of 2,434 30-foot equivalent miles. So the terminology is a little different. That's how we manage, but uh, I'll convert that to lane miles because I think that's uh, how state and Caltrans reports their numbers. So we have a little over... It's a, uh, roughly around 6,000 uh, lane miles of streets, and I think Caltrans is, is around 55,000, so we're uh, one-tenth of the state level. But we're, uh, for a city, it's a good-sized uh, network to uh, 
in, be, uh, be in charge of. So that means, you know, we have to really be, uh, we don't have unlimited uh, budget. We, uh, now we have uh, roughly, as uh, Nate mentioned, $100 million a year to maintain this uh, huge network. So it definitely uh, performance and long-term performance is, is one of our focus areas. So as you can see in this table, most of our uh, streets are in the residential. So uh, two thirds are under residential and uh, this, this third and last column is uh, giving you the payment condition index. So PCI stands for payment condition index. This is an index that we use to, uh, for our asset management, just to see where we are, uh, big picture wise, network wise. And our goal is to improve this uh, year after year. So this index varies from zero to 100. The higher the number, the better the network and the condition of those streets and the pavements. So as you can see, our major streets uh, are definitely doing a lot better. So we have been focusing when uh, our funding was short on those uh, streets that carry most of the good and the traffic and uh, commerce. So those are in a better shape. But we have started uh, focusing on residential uh, since 2018. And we have a goal to maintain all of our residential streets also by 2028. So it's a, it's a very uh, aggressive goal that we set uh, for ourselves after, you know, after the city uh, had a bond measure that's specifically geared towards pavements and pavement maintenance. So for, uh, for, again, for this presentation, uh, they, uh, they also, you know, the, there was interest to uh, just to see the trend of uh, the price difference, as uh, 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 speakers mentioned here, the uh, the price the uh, the price is higher compared to a regular hot mix asphalt. So rub rice hot mix asphalt uh, is a little bit uh, higher, but uh, you know this is just the average price that we uh, we get from our beds uh, year over year, uh, going back to 2016. Uh, to 2022, which is uh, this current year. So we every year we have projects that we pu uh, push out to bed and we get uh, these projects, you know, uh, anywhere from four to six uh, bids from the contractors. And you, 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 as you can see the gap, but you know, the, what's really interesting is the, is the last two years, right? So 2021, going from 2021 to 2022, we definitely saw that increase in prices and that's mainly because of the you know overall uh, inflation and uh, the market trend that we have seen but you know as you can see this trend is exactly the uh, parallel so it's uh, it's happening with the conventional uh, product as well how about our usage so how uh, you know uh, how much of the this uh, product or uh, rubberized hot mix asphalt do we use uh, in our maintenance so the tonnage, uh, you know, is the, the historical trend is right there in this uh, in this graph, as you can see. And as I mentioned, as we have uh, increased our funding, our tonnage uh, of this product is also going up. And uh, besides the uh, budget, uh, also is the performance of the product, and we uh, we have been tracking the performance throughout uh, time. You know, since uh, uh, we have our whole asset management. And we are pretty happy with the results. And uh, it's definitely uh, staying in a better shape and a good shape for a longer time. And you know, I, I, that's definitely extending our dollars. In terms of recycled tires and sustainability, uh, again, that's, that's, an, uh, that's a trend that you will be hearing uh, you know, from multiple audiences and specifically in our industry, in payment industry, the future is uh, you know, more recycled products and more uh, sustainability of our roads. And we're, we're uh, really proud of that because, uh, you know, when we actually converted these numbers and we have this on our website as well that we, uh, you know, uh, we communicate to stakeholders, our uh, uh, political leaders, as well as residents, uh, is the tonnage that we have put down since, uh, for example, 2014, 419,000 tons and uh, converting uh, to passenger tire equivalent that has been diverted from going to landfill, that's equivalent to almost 1 million tires. So just breaking down, you know, uh, the reasons why we, we uh, use it, you know, why San Jose uses uh, rubber as high mix asphalt. Uh, so definitely the environmental friendliness and sustainability is on top of uh, uh, the list. The 
noise reduction. So that's something that we, uh, our residents actually notice that when we, uh, when, you know, especially when there's a, a rough road that we go and uh, uh, either rehabilitate or overlay with this product is the uh, significant reduction in noise that we, uh, we receive and uh, reduce the spray and splash goes with that. So it's definitely a safer, uh, safer product uh, as the wearing course on top of our, our roads. Increased durability, so that, uh, as I mentioned, that is, uh, I think that's the, the, the most important part. It's this, this uh, product not only is, has uh, recycled material in it, it actually has better performance. We, we, we've seen it throughout the years and uh, you know, the field performance, the actual field performance that we, uh, we get in the field. And increased reflective cracking. So we, uh, in San Jose, we have a lot of old roads, and uh, some of our roads have uh, thick, thicker sections. And we cannot just go and rehabilitate all the way down to the aggregate base. But uh, we found out uh, using uh, rubberized hot mess asphalt, uh, we get, you know, uh, we are able to retard the reflective cracking for a longer period of time. What streets do we use uh, or do we treat? Because uh, as, as I mentioned, we have both major streets and residential. We actually uh, use it uh, mainly on major streets, but since uh, last year, we also started uh, implementing this in our residential program just, as, uh, just to monitor because we had some concerns about uh, some of the slow speed areas and some raveling that we uh, might be encountering. So we Wanted to be a little cautious with that, but uh, we we're starting to uh, get into our residential streets as well. The typical thicknesses that we use with this product uh, is two inches, but we have done th as thin as th uh, one and a half inches in some uh, instances as well. And uh, the payment structure that we use this uh, is uh, mill and fail, but uh, in San Jose we also want to you know uh, use other recycling tools in our toolbox. So that uh, last one, that last bullet point right there, called in-place recycling or CIR, is another uh, great recycling technology that we've been uh, a great advocate and uh, user since 2014 or 2013, where you uh, use actually 100% recycled material at the street. You know, there's a recycling train that goes in and pulverizes the material in place it, uh, by adding a little bit of asphalt, a little bit of cement, and you stabilize that as a base. And we cap it with rubberized hot mix asphalt uh, on top for the wearing course. And we've been happy with, that, with, that, with those results. What are some of the constraints that we, you know, we have seen with our experience? So this product, you know, like anything else, it's not you know, that uh, it's a perfect scenario for any, uh, for any case or location. So it has its own constraints. Uh, definitely the temperature sensitivity. So this, uh, uh, this material needs to be produced at higher temperatures compared to conventional hot mix asphalt. And uh, with that comes with uh, compaction issues. So just to give you an example, we, we, uh, we have a pro we have, so this year's project, you know, on, the, on our uh, 2022 project, we, for those of you who are familiar with San Jose, we have a project that uh, is going to repave the Stevens Creek, which uh, which uh, which is right across uh, one of the biggest uh, shopping malls in San Jose and Santana Row, which is another uh, touristy attraction, and it goes for uh, for seven miles. So we have that uh, as a project, but you know the permitting and encroachment permits came in late, and the contractor delayed us, and we were going to pave that before the holidays, but uh, because of the temperature sensitivity and the change in temperature. Unfortunately, we had to uh, defer it to next year. But uh, just, you know, we, we just want to be careful with the compaction because what, what that means is uh, we don't want to uh, compromise performance and the long-term durability. Uh, but just something that, you know, uh, as practitioners, you got to be aware of uh, the, about this product. So uh, that also goes with night paving. Uh, we don't do a lot, not a lot of night paving like Caltrans, but, uh, you know, because of that, sensitivity to temperature and compaction, you've got to uh, have a trained personnel to, uh, to deal with material. And uh, higher initial cost, so that's, that's definitely there, but you know, in my opinion, you uh, get that, the durability, the increased durability that you get uh, definitely pays for that initial cost that you pay. Uh, and 
plus the sustainability. And uh, I think that's, again, my, my personal uh, uh, opinion is the future of our industry is using more recycled products in our pavements. And uh, I think that's where we're seeing the new infrastructure bill as well, that uh, that's where the tailwind and uh, future stands. Some of the key uh, six, uh, lessons learned and keys to successful projects, if you are thinking, if you are a uh, local agency or if, you, uh, if you're thinking about using this product, is uh, compaction. Compaction is really important with uh, uh, meeting the in-place density and durability for, uh, and temperature of the material as it gets delivered to the site. Having uh, updated specification, you know, uh, doing your homework about that and uh, making sure you have a good performance-based uh, specification and incentive, disincentive for the contractor to, to do a good job. And train personnel and staff. So, the, you know, training is really key. I think we, uh, if we could emphasize that, you know, especially on, uh, for smaller agencies and users who, who haven't done it in the past, uh, having, you know, ha some hands-on training and uh, getting familiar with the product before using it and putting in specs is important. San Jose Recycles, we, we, uh, we are a big advocate of recycling and using recycled products, and uh, we're actually excited uh, where, uh, with the future. And, uh, you know, uh, I think with, uh, with everything in, uh, in our industry and how things are going, it's exciting times to, to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for that information on your local government perspective on rubberized asphalt. Uh, Last but not least, we have Katrina Barros. Uh, she is the office chief of the As Office of Asphalt Pavement at Caltrans, or California Department of Transportation. Uh, she has 35 years at Caltrans, uh, with, with the last 25 years working in materials, geotechnical, and pavement engineering. She started in District 4, which is in the Bay Area, um, in engineering services for eventually promoting her way to the district materials engineer. As district materials engineer, she is responsible for. She was responsible for the materials engineering laboratory, and the and the related testing efforts that that lab conducted for for District Four. Uh, in 2006, she moved to California Transportation. I'm sorry, Caltrans headquarters lab, also known as Trans Lab, um, here in Sacramento to work in the office of asphalt concrete, and she's had various assignments within that office but most recently leading to her being uh, the office, being promoted to the office chief at uh, the Office of Asphalt Pavements. So with that, I'll introduce Katrina Barros. All right, great, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Um, I was at the uh, California Asphalt Paving Association uh, conference last week, and so just FYI, we are the fourth largest economy. We beat out Germany, so sorry, Germany. It is now California. Um, so as uh, Nate mentioned, my office deals with uh, everything asphalt concrete. So we have all the specifications, which includes the rubberized specifications. I also deal with in-place recycling. I deal with design guidance to the engineers, and I also deal with pavement preservation. So, you know, I get the how can we use more rubber? How can we use more pavement preservation? How can we use more recycling? <laughs> you know, so, uh, so my office has to balance all these competing interests, so just to let you know um, my perspective. So my presentation, I'm just gonna go over, um, this guy, okay. I'm just gonna go over a little bit of a background, super short. Um, the annual crumb rubber report, which was mentioned earlier, the 2020 report is expected to be out soon. It is being reviewed by management, so it is not quite out yet. However, I'll give you the highlights. Um, you'll get the sneak peek of the information for 2021. Um, I'll talk about current design guidance and then the next steps, where we're going, what kind of other things we're gonna to do to actually potentially increase uh, the use of rubber in our pavements. All right, so uh, background. You know, Caltrans has used uh, RHMA, or it used to be called RAC, now it's RHMA. Uh, since the 90s so it's it's been around for us for a long time and our maintenance technical advisory guide actually recommends a reduced thickness if uh, you use 
RHMA because it's really been beneficial for uh, reflective cracking. And this was verified by research documents done by UCPRC in 2007. There was a report done that validated, you know, all our assumptions at the time uh, for our design. And, you know, uh, Nate mentioned the uh, Dixon Landing Road. Well, here's a fun fact, Nate. In 1997, I was working in the geotechnical office in District 4, and I was doing the preliminary uh, materials report for that project. And so uh, we were actually looking, uh, because there's a fair amount of uh, compressible materials in that area, we always look at how we can offset loads. So we were actually looking at styrofoam film and the tires, and we were evaluating both of those uh, uh, processes. Then I got promoted. Okay. Darn, but good. So I handed the box over to somebody else, you know, with all the files. All right, you take it from here. And I actually got the phone call like about six or seven months later. Are you serious about this tire thing? And uh, yeah, yeah, we're serious about that tire thing. So actually, I'm really excited to know that I had a little bit of that, of that big job. So uh, it, yeah, it's good to be part of a landmark project. I think that's uh, pretty awesome. So um, We've had some background, and now I'm going to jump kind of straight into the crumb rubber report. All right, so this is the tw oh, this is the 2021 annual crumb rubber report. As I said, managers are looking at it. Um, so this is data from 435 projects in uh, last calendar year. Um, there's estimated 3.48 million waste tires diverted from the landfills and the stockpiles. Uh, we did 3.33 uh, million metric tons of asphalt in 2021, uh, 2.0 million uh, metric tons being conventional asphalt, 1.27 metric tons being asphalt containing crumb rubber. So we're at 38.35%. Um, as Karina no uh, noted earlier, our asphalt, our total asphalt production did go down in 2021. We'll go to this. So this is the chart over the years since 2000, just the historic use of uh, asphalt using a crumb rubber modifier. Again, up and down, up and down. Um, but as you'll see, we are still well above our goal of 35% for 2021 at 38.3%. But again, our asphalt usage has been lower in 2021. I, I can make uh, suppositions about why that is, but you know the reality is when it comes to the selection between asphalt versus concrete, uh, we're headquarters, we're here to help, right? We only, you know, we only guide policy, and really that ultimate decision about what gets used as a strategy is really left up to the designer and the, and the districts. Another table that was in the report that I found pretty interesting was the categories where um, RHMA is used the most. You'll see here 43% uh, of the crumb rubber was actually used in a pavement preservation application, which really isn't too surprising. Um, pavement preservation is considered a tenth, one-tenth of uh, overlay. Um, so because of the SB1 money and the way it funneled into us, a lot of it initially got, uh, was put into what's considered HM1 funds, um, HM1 projects, because they're actually very quick delivery. They can get turned over very quickly. So perhaps not surprisingly that we've had more rubber in those projects because they were delivered quicker, while the SB1, SB1 money gets funneled through the shop projects, which takes longer. Um, so I'm not too surprised that there has been, there were a lot of rubber projects um, that were considered pavement preservation. Uh, rehab, full rehab, and new capacity projects. You know, we're not, uh, we don't do as much as those, especially new capacity. We, we haven't been doing as many projects along those lines. So again, I'm not overly surprised um, that that usage is lower. Uh, ca a capital preventative maintenance project is kind of a, between a pavement preservation and a major rehab, and that's also funded, you know, by our shop. So uh, a significant amount of that also requires rubber, and that's also because of our guidance to our designers. So we have what's in our highway design manual. This is our current guidance uh, when you use our HMA. So it is specified as the surface layer of choice for all projects. So either RHMA gap graded or RHMA open graded, 
And any design exception to that has to go through our office for approval. So if a district isn't going to use RHMA, we have to okay it. Now, what's interesting is, you know, districts are fairly autonomous. Um, I personally, I've been in, I've hit this position, it's been about a year now, I've received one, <laughs> one uh, request for an exception. Do I really think that only one project um, didn't use RHMA? Yeah, I doubt it, uh, but that is, you know, but some of these things aren't completely on our control. Uh, but we do require it and they are supposed to ask us if they're not using it. Um, our highway design manual also requires uh, zero, uh, 15 hundredths RHMA over a tenth HMA, and part of that is for smoothness. Uh, smoothness is a really big thing in our department. We've talked about sustainability. Um, we've realized smoother pave, pavement leads to better vehicle uh, operation, which actually really, really helps as far as cumulative greenhouse gas emission savings more than a lot of other uh, processes that we can use. And that was another study that's been initiated by UCPRC. Just the fact that if a car is running at its peak efficiency because the road is smooth, you really can save a lot of money in uh, greenhouse, gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So if a pavement has greater distress, then we recommend two tenths of RHMA over the pavement. Okay, so just looking ahead, um, actually, I would have updated this slide, but I had a very interesting meeting yesterday, so I'll have to just uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, UCPRC is funded by CalRecycle and Caltrans to do research on RHMA. Um, there is a uh, phase two or phase three, phase four, I don't know, <laughs> of what they're going to start working on next. And uh, what I found really interesting is what they're really looking is increasing the use of rubber in the dense graded HMA. And this isn't the surface core. So when I've talked about the RHMA previously, that was all surface mix. What they're really looking at is the structural section HMA and increasing the rubber in those, um, in those sections. So they will be looking at a dry process. They will be looking at, uh, uh, looking at and evaluating and testing um, a semi-dry process, a diluted wet process, field blend with agitation, and a wet process terminal blend. And so they will be evaluating all these processes again for increasing rubber in the dense graded structural layers of pavement. And um, our pilots that we are currently working on at Caltrans is the use of 10% recycled asphalt pavement in our HMAG. Uh, right now, uh, there is no guidance towards using RAP in RHMAG. So we have uh, two pilots that just finished construction this year. We've collected samples. We're going to do some testing. We have two more uh, coming up in Imperial County, which is down by San Diego, Ventura County. And then we have two projects slated for fiscal year 23-24. And we will accumulate all that data. And really, the hope is um, we have a non-standard special provision right now, and we will tweak it based on the data analysis we get. And our eventual goal is to have that as a commonplace you know, practice that we can incorporate in our uh, standard section 39 specification. Um, and again, UCPRC will be uh, testing and uh, evaluating and helping us um, with those pilots. So that is what's going on right now, and questions. <laughs> Thank you for that. How about one more round of applause for all of our speakers? So let's open it up to questions. Who wants to know about rubberized asphalt? <laughs> okay, we'll take questions in person and then we'll take questions virtually. If you are asking a question virtually, please hit the widget for questions. And you, can, you can ask in relation to our speakers or if you have a cow recycle question, I, I probably can answer it. I'm going to ask Karina, but it might be you or any one of the other ones. So in your PowerPoint presentation, you, you talk about high net rubber. And 13 to 17% was scrap tires, I think you said. And then the other's high net, a certain percentage, which I didn't get quick enough. What is the def? Is that buffings or is that truck tires? Because I know there's a few using buffings now. And then that's also high natural. Rubber. I've been told it's heavy truck tires so like those OTR? oh that would make sense otr tires yeah mm -hmm. 
Which is kind of interesting where they're getting it from. What about also from. some semi truck, you know, ground ground semi truck tires too have have higher natural rubber in them also. Okay, so is somebody in your definition? I just looked online. I was kind of curious because I okay. hear that term all the time, and and I'm always wondering what what does that mean. I couldn't even find it online. So high nat has to do with it has to have a natural, like a a rubber content above a certain amount, and I can send you the specification, but. I guess they found by sorting the tires, they can, I guess, section or segregate the ones that are higher in natural rubber. So once the material is made, how do you determine, I'm sorry, that's <laughs> Oh. Can you take, I mean, as a processor, can you take the material? This microphone. Microphone. Okay. As a processor, can you take the material that you get and determine whether or not it qualifies as high net? That's a good question. I would probably defer to our testing consultants, and there's several. If you do not have one, I can set you up with one that they can probably help you. What, what? Um, there's a couple that kind of do rubber testing across the, one in state, and then there's one out of state that a lot of people lean into. I think the other side of it is we do uh, lean on the, the processors or the suppliers to certify that th their rubber meets whatever standard for high natural content. Is, is called for in, in the uh, in the mixed design or you know for the process but, but I can if you want I believe my contact information is in um, on the website you can always reach out to me and I can send you the specification yeah if I may add to that I think yeah so the high natural uh, rubber I think it helps with the elastic recovery of the product the final product so the idea is it will give it more viscoelastic properties if you have more you know percentage of the high natural rubber in your chrome rubber that you're going to react with your version binder um, I was curious in non-technical terms the difference between uh, dry and wet processes I'll, I'll attempt that one uh, wet process you add the rubber into the binder into the liquid asphalt dry process you add it into the aggregate in, in the mixing process, so it doesn't, it's not pre-mixed with the binder per se, with the liquid asphalt. Are there cost differences? It's, it's really how it helps the hot mix. If you blend it with a binder, you get the elasticity into the binder. If you're adding it as an aggregate, it's not really helping as much as it could from a binder perspective. And, and yes, there are cost differences. Um, Depending on how you mix the rubber into the binder, um, wet process asphalt rubber, which we use a lot here in California, which is the kind of, uh, I would characterize it as lumpy peanut butter, that slide that she showed, the, the bumpy, lumpy stuff. Um, there's, there's a certain uh, set of equipment that, you, that is typically used that has a cost and associated depreciation, mobilization, and things like that do add to the cost of mixing that rubber into the binder. Um, the, the, the smooth peanut butter, the, the terminal blend stuff, um, there is also a set of equipment for that, uh, but typically it's located at an asphalt refinery and typically adds less amount, less additional cost to the process because it's fixed and you just keep pumping stuff through there over the lifespan of the material. It doesn't move around, I'll put it that way. Um, we have a Thanks, Nate. question. Thanks, um, Nate. I was glad to hear, Katrina, that you're considering uh, or you're planning to do some dry process testing, mm -hmm. uh, and you were looking at the uh, structural layer and the dense graded. Mm -hmm. And uh, one application that we we understand is very promising is thin overlays that would uh, go a long way toward helping cities like San Jose instead of having to put down two inches. Uh, maybe you could lay down one inch of a slightly more expensive but much more durable uh, thin layered dry process rubber modified asphalt. So I'm wondering, is California looking at that at all? But we do that already. The, our, our maintenance technical advisory guide allows that. Sorry. Yes. No. But not, not in the, you're talking about dry process? Oh, in the dry process. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I was confused. Um, okay, noted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, again, um, Topher Buck from Safer Consumer Products. 
I don't know if asphalt rejuvenators are used at all in California, but I'm just curious whether, you know, essentially like what kind of interactions there are between asphalt rejuvenators and rubber in asphalt. Like, does does it eliminate the need for them? Do they play nicely together? Currently, we actually do use a modifier, which is similar to a rejuvenator, but there's no rejuvenator specifically required. Um, but there is a modifier component, and then kind of talk. I think I mentioned right now we we specify a rubberized asphalt in this recipe method. In the olden days, there was no modifier. In the olden days, there was no high nat. There was actually like these equations of how you came up with the blend, but because it was so complicated, people went to, if you mix it a certain way, this is the best product you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So kind of going back to that early research and kind of looking at the logistics of, do we still need that modifier? Um, if we're onboarding this new scrap tire, high nat crumb rubber, you know, does that help offset some of the considerations that what they were looking at in the original specification? So when I say looking at my specification, it's going back to those original folks that help put it together and start asking those questions and, and seeing what can we do. So I'll comment from a Caltrans perspective, you know, you're right, uh, the, the rejuvenators are, are silent in our section 39 specification. That said, we are looking at uh, the current specification allows up to 25% um, wrap, but we do have pilot projects going on right now up to 40% wrap. So we have to figure out how that rejuvenator language fits in. And then with the, um, with the RHMA, um, with the wrap in RHMA, another thing we're looking at, this is a little bit off topic, but we're, not, we're also looking at not just wrap in RHMA, but rubberized wrap in RHMA. So there's, there's a few things that we're, we're looking at. So. And I'll just add, in Green Book, we do allow for rejuvenators uh, when you go above 20% wrap. Scott Demetro with Prism. Um, I got two questions, one for, well, kind of two for Frank. Um, I, and, and for the whole t the group, we're talking a lot about RHMA. And there are certainly some other products out there that are using high rubberized binder contents, uh, asphalt rubber chip seals, there are rubberized slurry seals. Uh, back in the day, John Birchfield, Amy Wong, uh, City of San Jose, it's probably 20 years ago now, we did a lot of work with them with these products. And even though we're talking about RHMA here, what about those other products and opening up specifications to allow more rubber in the slurries and, and micros and the chip seals to increase that usage? That's, that's the question. Um, and then two comments, one for your warm mix, I'm sorry, for your rubberized hot mix where you can't get it to compact, maybe you want to consider warm mix asphalt because as you know, Frank, it, it works and you can get your density and compaction. And my second comment is for Katrina, since we do everything in the state in standard, why are we still reporting in metric tons? Yeah, that's a good question. Frank, I'll let that up to you though. So. But Frank, are we looking at more rubberized maintenance and preservation products? Yes, yeah, we, uh, we are definitely looking into, uh, so as a standard of practice, we do, a, uh, we do quite a bit of microsurfacing uh, in, in the city because and the reason why we like microsurfacing is uh, definitely it breaks down quicker and uh, with the tra with the amount of traffic we have we we you know even even with that you know we all we're always constantly getting complaints about you know you guys uh, have closed my street I can't even go to work and all that so so that's definitely something that you know slurry seal we don't do much and as far as the chip seal so San Jose it's kind of unique you know in the past we uh, like you mentioned we had you uh, definitely uh, usage of uh, asphalt rubber chips so we haven't done it recently because a uh, number of reasons so uh, the main thing was the windshield uh, you know when uh, cracks that, we, that you get with the chip seal and the other thing is really bleeding the that product when it's used with terminal blend wheat uh, and we've seen this in the field and you know neighboring agencies that use it where sometimes you 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 get that asphalt uh, binder that's spread they you know again it's, it could be a workmanship uh, issue but it migrates through with with the with the higher traffic especially with higher traffic it migrates through the surface and it creates a very dangerous situation as far as friction and safety so but we we are always looking into new products we uh, did uh, look into a slurry seal from a company in uh, down in Southern California actually as a pilot that had good amount of uh, 
uh, rubber in it, you know, as a, and we were open to it, but there were no producers, you know, in our area, and we couldn't just uh, sole source it from, uh, from one source in Southern California. So that, that's what uh, the barrier was, and, you know, we definitely are, uh, you know, like I said, big picture, we, San Jose, we really want to use uh, more recycled products and moving towards sustainability, and we think that's the future, and uh, increased usage of wrap, increased usage of uh, rubber products is definitely on that. Okay, we have a few questions virtually. We're going to take these and then end. This for Karina. Um, Nick Amante says, thank you for your very informative pr presentation. Uh, to confirm, as of today, is there currently no terminal blend being produced in California? To my knowledge, no. There was one in Nevada. Um, but it was my understanding when they sold the business, they didn't sell the rights to that terminal blend rubber to whoever they handed it off to. I am... We're working with a couple people to develop a terminal blend for Southern California, but currently no. Um, and when I say working with, we have to update our green book specs to allow them into the market. There are a couple things that in the specification that were restrictive. Um, we're working to widen that. We did some proof of concept to make sure that it wasn't gonna cause any issues. Um, and then also Granite recently has purchased a terminal in Bakersfield, Constantino Asphalt. Um, and all the sell-offs of the different refineries, we happen to capture one, and we are working to create our own internal um, terminal blend rubber product. And actually, we also have a terminal blend plastic asphalt product, which we're really excited about. So I know tomorrow, I believe Edgar Heaty will be here, and he's gonna talk a lot more about rubber and some other, some other items. Yeah, he's, he's actually gonna speak about some of the environmental issues that they found um, looking at rubberized asphalt in, in consideration, but that's that's the But he's also an asphalt madman, so if you have any questions related to that, that's the man to ask. I will second that. He is an asphalt <laughs> madman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, second question is from C. Domer, who writes, curious if anyone on the panel can speak to the tire rolling resistance, the difference between RHMA and standard asphalt for tire rolling resistance. Um, I am curious of the relative differences. I can tell you from a placement standpoint, there you require a higher compactive effort, and there is a concern with rebound. So you can compact it, but because of the nature of rubber, it when you apply that compactive effort, it, the rubber kind of is stressed, and over time it rebounds. So you have to like compact it, come back and recompact it, and kind of check it again. Um, and then the more aggressive you are sometimes, they can almost hurt the process. So you have to be very educated in that compactive effort. You wanna get on it early, but you kind of don't wanna over vibe it because you'll just create more internal tension in that rubber. I'm not, I'm not sure who, who had the slide, but uh, we did talk about smoothness and, and wanting to get you know, the maximum smoothness, which m might reduce rolling resistance, might. Um, but I think a lot of that rolling resistance is incumbent in the tire or inherent in the tire itself. Um, and I'm not sure how much the pavement tire interaction changes that. Oh, you're talking about the tire interacting with the, the pavement itself. Right, the rolling resistance of the tire. So. Anyway. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thank Nate and the panelist speakers. Thank you.